Today on Mr. Media, I'll talk to writer and comics historian Brian Walker about his two new books, The Comics and Doonesbury and the Art of G.B. Trudeau. Stick around. This interview will go from black and white to four colors in nothing flat. Hey, did you know that you can listen to the latest Mr. Media on your phone with the Stitcher app? Stitcher is smart radio for your smartphone. Mr. Media is on demand and on the go with Stitcher. Download Stitcher for your phone today. Get the free download at Stitcher.com. That's S-T-I-T-C-H-E-R.com. So much media, so little time. Who keeps track of it all? That would be me. This is Bob Andelman, and this is the Mr. Media Interview. You know, MrMedia.com, MRMedia.com. Stop by and check it out. There are more than 700 archived celebrity interviews for your listening pleasure. The show is brought to you today by Audible. Audible is offering Mr. Media listeners a free audiobook download and 14-day trial to give you a chance to check out their amazing service. You can choose a free audiobook from Audible's library of thousands of titles including top comics books such as The Ten Cent Plague, The Great Comic Book Scare, and How It Changed America by David Haydu. Scott Adams, stick to drawing comics. Stick to drawing comics, monkey brain. Cartoonist ignores helpful advice. Or even an episode of The Shadow starring Brett Morrison. You can even download the biography of comic book and graphic novel legend Will Eisner, A Spirited Life, which I wrote and read. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash radio. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash radio for your free audiobook. Mr. Media is recorded live before a studio audience of small-bodied talking animals with giant heads and more wisecracks than Don Rickles in the new new media capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida. Comics are Brian Walker's life. It's a family business, after all. His dad, Mort, created or co-created Beetle Bailey, High and Lois, and the legendary but short-lived strip about strips, Sam Strip. Brian and his brother Greg have written and or inked Beetle Bailey and High and Lois alongside their dad now for years. And another generation comics creator, another second generation comics creator, Chance Brown, son of High and Lois co-creator and Hagar the Horrible creator Dick Brown, draws High and Lois. But starting back in college in the early 1970s, Brian carved out a corner of the industry for himself. It started when he profiled fledgling Doonesbury cartoonist Gary Trudeau in 1973 for Greg's alt-weekly newspaper, The Silver Lining. In the years that followed, Brian followed a dual path, writing gags for his father's strips, but also helping Mort Walker and his fellow comic strip masters see their dream come true, the International Museum of Comic Art, where Brian was a founder and director from 1974 to 1992. More recently, Brian has turned his attention to preserving and sharing comic strip history. His latest book, The Comics, puts together in one massive, exquisite volume what had previously been two pieces. It is an awesome collection of wonderful strips back to the beginning of the medium and all the way to the present day, a must-have collectible for any comics fan. A few months ago, he published another marvelous book, Doonesbury and the Art of G.B. Trudeau. Reading through it, I fell in love with the work of Jane Pauley's husband all over again. And with that, Brian Walker, welcome to Mr. Media. Nice to be here. How are you? I'm good. Good. Uh, Nice to have you. Uh, You do some extraordinary work, sir. Well, I enjoy my work. Uh, I I never look at the clock and, and, and see how many hours I put in, but I put in some long days and long weekends sometimes, but... Uh, it's really fun. It's taken me to a lot of really interesting places. I met an incredible amount of interesting people, just about any cartoonist you can think of. And cartoonists are, are such nice, interesting people to talk to, as as you well know. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've had the privilege of meeting quite a few of them. It's funny that you uh, started by talking about uh, the amount of time and the hours spent, because I, that's exactly where I wanted to start. I, I can only imagine that uh, the comics, uh, this book took many times more work and years possibly to put together and write than you had ever planned. Well, each volume uh, originally titled The Comics Since 1945 was actually the, the first book I did, mm-hmm. so it's kind of a Star Wars uh, backwards prequel thing, um, and the comics before 1945. Each of those projects were about a, a two-year uh, you know, run between doing the research, writing the... Um, 
text, picking the images, doing the layouts, you know, proofreading all the way through to the publicity and launch phase. Um, the first book, actually, I was I was so thrilled to be doing a book of that magnitude with a publishing company like Abrams, which is really one of the top art book publishers in the world. Mm-hmm. I just felt like, God, this is an incredible opportunity. I've got to do the best job I can. And I lit- literally put myself in physical therapy from sitting in front of the computer for too <laughs> long. You know, my, my hands started to go numb on me. Uh, you know, they, they, you know, just from kind of overwork, but it, it was worth it, I think. And um, now you've been a student of comics, and near as I can tell, all your life. I, but I wondered, though, did you learn things uh, in researching this book that surprised even you? Absolutely. Uh, I tell people that I was born with ink in my veins, and, and uh, I think I have a unique perspective because not only uh, was I sort of born into uh, a cartoon extended family, uh, John Cullen Murphy, who did Prince Valiant, was my godfather, and Dick Brown, who did Hagar the Horrible and High and Lois, performed my wedding ceremony, and uh, Jerry Dumas has been working for my father for over 50 years, so... I just sort of grew up in that whole environment, you know, with, where pens and inks and bottles, of, you know, bottles of ink and pencil sharpeners and everything were all over the place. Uh, but then also, actually, working as a professional cartoonist, I understand the deadlines and all, all the demands of, of the profession. But then also learning about the history of it, um, reading books and doing sort of primary research on these. Uh, history books I think I learn something new every day about it, about the subject it's just so deep and rich and that's one of the reasons I enjoy it so much Any uh, any good stories about some of the early creators you want to share? Oh boy uh, <laughs> it, it, you know, it's, it, people always say well, who's your favorite cartoonist? And I usually say well, it was the, one, the last exhibit I did or the last book I, I wrote I just uh, wrote an inter- introduction to a book that's coming out later this year from IDW uh, on Alex Raymond's Rip Kirby. Oh. And uh, it's the fourth volume in the series and actually the last volume of, of his work on the strip. And he died very tragically in 1956 in a car accident with uh, another cartoonist, Stan Drake. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's, a, it's a very tragic story because he was really kind of at the peak of his career at the time. And uh, there's been a lot of accounts and sort of even questions about whether he might have been trying to commit suicide. And and I actually, it, it happened not far from where I live here. So I, hmm. one day I drove over there and drove the, the route that he drove when he had the car accident and everything. Um, but uh, I, I found a letter from his old assistant who was working with him at the time, Ray Burns, who, whose uh, widow lives nearby here. Uh, and he said this whole idea that he was trying to commit suicide is just absolute hogwash. You know, he was he loved life. He was, a, uh, you know, and he never would have done it with another cartoonist in the car either. So, I mean, that's kind of like the um, more on a personal level. Um, you know, one of the things I I was really interested in discovering doing the comics before 1945 was was probably the most famous cartoonist of, of that era was Bud Fisher, who did Mutt and Jeff. Mm-hmm. Um, and people have sort of forgotten about him a little bit, but he, he actually had an ownership battle with Hearst that went all the way to the Supreme Court over the ownership of his characters. And I had never read that or heard that anywhere. Um, and it, Mutt and Jeff, of course, was probably the first successful daily comic strip. And in, in one episode, he just happened to write copyright Bud Fisher in the corner of it, and that was the basis of this ownership trial. Because back in those days, the the newspaper moguls, the heads of the syndicates and everything, Hearst and Pulitzer and the rest of them, they owned all the cartoonist's work. It was unheard of for a cartoonist to own their own work. Hmm. He was kind of a pioneer in that way. Did... Um as you would discover new tidbits about some of the older um, strips and the cartoonists, uh, 
you know, I know from my own experience in, in researching things, when I find out something new and exciting, I always want to share it with somebody. Uh, right. Who would you want to most share something with? Would you turn to your dad? Would you turn to your brother? Or? It depends on what area. If it, you know, if, it, if it's something that's more related to the current state of the profession or something, I might talk to my father. My father has an assistant named Bill Janoka, who is another one of these walking encyclopedias of, of useless information, but you can always bounce <laughs> ideas off him. But then I have a whole network of sort of uh, fellow cartoon scholars that I call. Uh, Art Spiegelman's a good friend. I call him every once in a while, and we just talk comics and things that we like and things that we get passionate about. And uh, Art Bob Harvey is another guy we, we have sort of, Every month or so, we just pick up the phone and, and talk comics for a while. Hmm. Um, and I stay in touch with other friends in, the, in that area of the business. Um, Pete Maresca, who's done some really great books uh, on early newspaper strips. Um, uh, there's a guy named Tom Gamble, who I just got an email from, who's a, a writer on The Simpsons, who loves old comics, and particularly Ernie Bushmiller's Nancy. He's just crazy about Nancy. Uh, so it's fun to kind of share passions with, with people that are, have kind of similar interests. Are there uh, modern comics that uh, remind you, uh, ha- having as much knowledge of the history as you do, are there modern comics, modern cartoonists who remind you most of uh, the great uh, origins uh, of the medium? Well, in my book, the, the comics since 1945, I was very interested. I mean, there was a wave of cartoonists uh, in the 80s with Burke Breathed and uh, Bill Watterson, Gary Larson. There, there was kind of almost a, a second golden age or a silver age of newspaper comics, but those guys all kind of retired early. And then there was a wave of kind of what I call the new traditionalists or something that Patrick McDonald and Jerry Scott and Jim Borgman and Rick Kirkman, uh, just with zits and baby blues and mutts, I think that they were strips that were probably not revolutionary in any particular way, but they took all the best qualities of some of the great old strips. And and, uh, and they're, they're, I know those guys personally, and they all have great respect for all the old masters and, and even my father's generation of cartoonists, uh, you know, Sparky Schultz and... Johnny Hart and Bill Keen and Mort Walker and that 50s generation they, they just revere those guys so that's kind of an interesting uh, group uh, I know there's a period sort of in the modern age where syndicates are always looking for the term they use was edgier comics you know mm-hmm. something that's drawn in a scrawl and that's autobiographical and that's kind of pushing the limits a little bit and there's, there's some strips like that that I enjoy but um you know, for my money, Zips is one of the best contemporary comic strips out there today. Um, I'm going to just break in for a second. I keep hearing a motor running. Is that on your end? Uh, I, it might be my um, my hard drive or disk drive or something. I don't know. Oh. Let, me, let me try something here. Okay. Yeah. I, sometimes I get that when I'm you know, doing stuff in... Uh, okay. Well, I, I didn't know it was something you had any control I'll, over, but... Yeah, I don't I don't think I do. I, I can hear a little bit myself. Okay. All right, well, we'll keep going. It's okay. Yeah. Uh, all right, one more question uh, before we break. Um, we mentioned your dad. How is your dad? He's been on, the, he's been on this show uh, twice, and uh, I've interviewed him two other times uh, for different projects. How's he doing? He's doing good. Um, you know, he's 87 now. <laughs> Um, most of his friends are no longer with us you know he's kind of like the last man standing in a way a, a living legend they call him uh, you know he's he's had some health problems a, a year and a half ago he had what I call a walk-in heart attack where he just wasn't feeling well and they went in there and the next thing I know they were putting stints and stuff in um, but uh, you know he's anxious to for the weather to warm up and get out on the golf course. And uh, he still is drawing, you know, he do, does the pencil drawings on Beetle Bailey. And that is kind of like the the all-time record for a cartoonist on his original strip. 
because he's been doing he's been actually drawing Beetle for sixty one years now. Wow, that's amazing. And I know the last time I talked to him, he was just filling me up with all the different strip ideas he had and the things he was yeah. still trying to push. And boy, yeah. he, he's an amazing guy, and, and certainly give him our best. Uh, I always yeah. enjoy talking oh. with him. And yeah, no, he's um, his health is good. I mean, you know, for for someone that age, I mean, he's not, you know, he's not without some problems, but it's pretty good. Good, good. Well, um, Brian, let's take a, a quick break. Uh, this is Bob Andelman, and you're listening to the Mr. Media interview with Brian Walker, the author of The Comics and Doonesbury and the Art of G.B. Trudeau. And we'll be right back. Extra, extra, extra good news. The makers of Jell-O have discovered a way to give you rich, luscious chocolate pudding far more easily and far more economically than ever before. With the new Jell-O chocolate pudding powder, you can make old-fashioned pudding, smooth, creamy, and chocolatey, just like the ones grandmother used to make back in the good old days. Now you can have them again, and this is all you have to do. Just combine the contents of a package of Jell-O chocolate pudding with some milk in the top of your double boiler, letting it cook until it becomes smooth and thick. When the mixture has cooled, serve it in sherbet glasses. You'll have enough for six helpings. And that means six happy people. Jell-O chocolate pudding is so simple, so inexpensive, and so downright delicious that you mustn't delay trying it. Ask your grocer for Jell-O chocolate pudding, and if he hasn't put it in stock yet, be sure he orders it for you. Remember the name, Jell-O chocolate pudding. Now, this is the amazing question. If you could read my thoughts, you'd know you're listening to Mr. Media Radio. Hello, this is Bob Andelman, and you're listening to the Mr. Media Interview with Brian Walker, the author of The Comics and Doonesbury and the Art of G.B. Trudeau. And in this part of the interview, we're going to talk about Doonesbury and Gary Trudeau. Um, Brian, I said in the introduction that uh, your book on Gary Trudeau and Doonesbury made me fall in love with his work all over again. It's really amazing how many highlights that man's career has enjoyed in this industry. Yeah, it was it was an amazing project to work on. Uh, I it was it was sort of almost um, I don't like to use the word blessed because you know it's <laughs> but it, it 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 just was everything kind of fell into place. It was it was kind of uncanny serendipity is the term I used. And Gary was just incredibly cooperative. Opened up his all of his archives in his studio. Um, uh, I met uh, an old friend of mine, David Stanford is. Gary's book editor at used to be at Henry Holt, and he's a good friend of mine, and he was incredibly helpful. And uh, there's a book designer, George Corsillo, who worked for Gary for over 25 years, who lives right here in Connecticut. And I recommended to Yale that they hire him to design the book, and they did. So <laughs> I've never had such a great working relationship with the book designer on any project I've ever worked on. And it was just almost overwhelming to me. I mean, I had been following the strip pretty much since day one, and I had all the collections, and I was aware of some of the projects he'd done over the years, most of, the, most of them being uh, fundraising projects, like the Great Doomsbury sellout and the Starbucks uh, program that he did. Um, but until I really got into it and started looking through all the drawings and the, at the products themselves and everything, it, it became overwhelming at one point. I was just, I just I was not sure how I could kind of shoehorn all this into one single <laughs> volume. Uh, but it, it was, uh, I was very pleased with the final results of the way the book came out. The, the publishing comp- company was incredibly supportive, uh, did a beautiful job on the printing of it, the, the publicity, uh, you know, Gary kind of uh, made himself very available for interviews because it was also the 40th anniversary of the strip, so he was just everywhere, you know, <laughs> every TV show and magazine, and so it was a pretty exciting project. I, I was jokingly telling somebody, I, I think it's time to retire. I think I, I think I peaked or something. <laughs> no, don't retire. I'm sure there's some more of these uh, yet to be done that uh, your touch uh, will be appropriate for. I, I, you know, one of the things that I was noticing going through the book, and I remember back in college and after college, uh, 
collecting, uh, buying a lot of the collections. I had read them through the years, going back to, God, the, uh, the early early seventies, I guess, when I was in high school. And uh, as I was going through your book, I was thinking about uh, some of the particular runs that I really enjoyed. And I noticed it, what I liked over the years was always when he kind of broke that. I guess on TV they call it the fourth wall. You know, where where you're you're part of, you're in on the gag where you know supposedly you know the characters know that they're being drawn by Trudeau, and I wondered um, if you had any favorite runs having gone through pretty much the whole thing. Well, I I agree with you. I think what's interesting to look through the book and see the kind of evolution and, and journey that he's been on because the strip has changed quite a bit from the early kind of. Jules Pfeifferish days of when he first started to um, kind of his peak years during the Watergate era in terms of political controversy. But there was that period from the late 80s through about the mid 90s where he did a lot of self referential gags about, you know, Mike and Zonka reading through the mailbag and, mm-hmm. you know, and. Uh, but the strip, if you look at it, the strip now, it's changed very much from that. He doesn't do that so much anymore. And, and when I was going, looking at at it with Gary, he was looking back and said, boy, I, I probably overdid it back in the days with the self-referential stuff, but I don't do it anymore. And I kind of miss doing some of that kind of goofy, funny stuff because the strip has gotten very, uh, quite a bit more serious and with, um, you know, BD's uh, injury in Iraq and, and the rehabilitation of soldiers coming home, and some of the themes he's been uh, focusing on in, in the post nine eleven period. Mm-hmm. It has. I, I'm glad you brought that up. I I, I agree. I, I it, it's gotten heavier, and it, it was heavy. You know, all, it's always been kind of heavy at times, but it hasn't been heavy with that same comic zing that it once did, and which was. And you can, I think you can kind of tell that a lot of people may feel that way because it hasn't been, I don't know, it hasn't been breaking uh, into headlines the way it used to either. That it, it, it's just heavy, and I, I guess it just reflects wh- wherever Gary is in his head right now. Yeah, I, I think that um, well, certainly everybody's attention span is so fragmented all over the place these days that you kind of wonder what gets attention really, Charlie mm-hmm. Sheen or something. Um, <laughs> One of the things I think is very interesting, it, it has this sort of next generation of characters like Alex, who's uh, Mike's daughter, has really become kind of one of the main characters. And I really like her a lot. She's like my current favorite. Mm-hmm. And I think it's a little, Gary has, um, you know, even though he denies that any of it's that autobiographical, he does have a daughter who's in her 20s, as I do. And I, I see things there that I think... Uh, just a really insightful and sort of charming about when she's in college and she's studying for tests and you know finding a boyfriend and that's always been my favorite part of this trip is, is more of the characters and less the, the political comment is and, there a, it, do you have any sense if there is a uh, Trudeau in waiting as there were in the uh, uh, the Walker and the Brown families is there someone there to maybe pick up the strip in the future I don't think so <laughs> I, I think he Gary feels like I don't think he has any intention of retiring and I think he's very grateful for the run that he's had on the strip I think he sees like a lot of cartoonists that the newspaper business is very challenged right now um, the future of strips is is really kind of up in the air and uh, I, he's kind of wondering how long his, his run is going to last let alone you know some successor. I don't think there's any plan for anybody to continue it. Hmm. Well, he retires or well. And speaking of retirement, I was going to ask you, uh, knowing that you've spent some time and had access to him, uh, and you write about his breaks a bit in the book. Um, uh, any sense why uh, he continued? He would take breaks and continue, whereas uh, Bill Watterson on Calvin and Hobbes and. Uh, Gary Larson on the far side, uh, and, and Berkeley Breathed to to a degree also with uh, Bloom County before he came back and did Opus for a while uh, on a limited basis. Uh, why did Trudeau keep going uh, when these other guys of his era sort of uh, stopped? Well, I, I think it's it's just that's a, obviously a personal 
relationship that he has with his strip, he has kind of a different career arc in that he never actually intended to be a cartoonist. It was sort of almost an accidental career that he was, you know, he was doing this strip in the Yale Daily News and he was discovered by the founders of Universal Press Syndicate and really just the first few years of the strip were really on the job training for him. And I don't think he ever thought it would last this long. But there was a period probably, I would say, probably maybe 20, 25 years into it where I think he finally came to the realization that this is his life's work. This is what he was meant to do. <laughs> and uh, it's really what he does do. I think it, it, he's still challenged by it. Um, I think he still enjoys it. Um, and I think that the, the sabbaticals that he's taken periodically have given him enough rest and time to rejuvenate so that he comes back to it renewed. I mean, I, I think any cartoonist that that works on a strip as my dad has for over six decades or Charles Schultz on peanuts or, uh, Gary Trudeau on Doonesbury, they have periods where they're inspired and then periods probably where they struggle a little bit to hmm. come up with new inspiration. It's a, it's a hard thing to do. Well, uh, I didn't plan it this way, but uh, the last thing I want to talk to you about is something that's actually in the title of the book. It is the art of GB Trudeau, Gary Trudeau. Um, and one of the things that he took a lot of criticism for early in the early years of the strip was that the art wasn't very good. And um, I, I wondered if you had a sense of did he did he take that personally, and is that why it got so much better over the years, or was that was that a natural evolution, or was that Gary really working to become a better artist? Well, once again, it's 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 documented in the book kind of the, the long process that he went through. Uh, I, I think one of the most intriguing things about Gary, Gary's career, as well as what the book re- really reveals for the first time, is what a good artist he is mm-hmm. and how well kept a secret that was for so many years. And I find it kind of almost puzzling that, that, that Gary wouldn't have come out a long time ago and say, look at my artwork here, uh, you know, I can draw, here's the proof of it. Uh, and he just didn't feel like he needed to do that. I, I think he comes from kind of an old school family where there's a certain amount of, um, you know, you don't have to prove yourself. You don't have to You go out, you know, and um, push things in people's faces. You just accept that what you do is what you do. And I think it was a whole controversy that came up in the early 90s where the Wall Street Journal attacked him and said that he didn't even really draw his strip, that his assistant, Don Carlton, was his ghost. And, and uh, he invited them to come over and examine his drawings at that point when he was doing his stuff in pencil. Mm-hmm. And um, just to prove to them, of course, <clears throat> they never did. And those, I think the first time that one of those pencil sketches of his was ever reproduced was in my comic since 1945 book in 2002 um, so it, it's just still kind of puzzles me how, how that was such a well kept secret for so long and I think that that my book is all of his artwork it's, it's all reproduced from original strips either inked or penciled by him or inked by uh, Don Carlton mm-hmm. um, and you can really see how he grew and changed. I, I think in the first uh, period, from when the strip started to his first sabbatical, he felt that that's the way the strip looked. It was very static. It was characters talking to each other or watching TV or something. Very flat, not a lot of perspective. Uh, that was kind of his style, and he felt like that's what people expected to see. After he went on a sabbatical, he really made a conscious effort to redesign the strip and to use camera angles and close-ups and silhouettes, and and it really started to change radically in the 1980s. Hmm. And it was just, I think he kind of felt like he was kind of locked in those four panel boxes uh, for the first period, and then he broke out in the the 80s. Well, um, Brian, we're just about out of time, and I want to let everybody know that you can find Brian Walker's uh, extraordinary new books, The Comics, 
as well as Doonesbury and the Art of G.B. Trudeau at great bookstores everywhere, or you can order them right now at a great price at mrmedia.com, mrmedia.com. Uh, Brian, can people find you uh, online? Are you, do you have a website, a Twitter account, a Facebook, any of that stuff? Uh, not really. Uh, I have an email address, but uh, yeah, I, I, it really is a challenge to keep up with the deadlines. I'm writing for two syndicated comic strips, mm-hmm. and then on the side doing books that we haven't even talked about all the exhibits I've done over 70 exhibitions over the years. I just finished a series at the Charles Schultz Museum. So I just I just don't really have time. Uh, but uh, I'm always glad to hear from people. And, uh, you know, you can write through King Features Syndicate or or send me an email at highandlowest1 at AOL.com. Oh, you opened the floodgates there. Just remember, you gave that out. I didn't. <laughs> um, well, uh, Brian Walker, thank you so much for joining us on Mr. Media today. Thank you for having me. It's been fun. My pleasure. And, folks, for uh, more original interviews with America's top comic strip creators, uh, surf over to our main website, mrmedia.com, mrmedia.com. If you've enjoyed today's show, subscribe for free to Mr. Media via email, RSS, or iTunes, and you'll never miss a show. You can also listen with a piece of string, as they do in uh, Connecticut, a piece of string and a tin can in many locations. And show your support of Mr. Media by supporting our sponsors, including Audible. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash radio. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash radio for your free audiobook. We're also supported by the thepartyauthority.us. Call DJ Ira for all your party entertainment needs nationwide at 1-800-DIAL-DJs or visit their website, thepartyauthority.us. We'll even accept a donation via PayPal if you'd like to help defray the cost of producing Mr. Media. If you've got an idea for a guest to comment on today's show or would like to advertise on Mr. Media Radio, email me directly at bob at mrmedia.com. You can also follow Mr. Media on Facebook, Twitter, or our new YouTube video channel. Thanks so much for joining us today. really appreciate you sharing a piece of your day with Mr. Media. Thanks for listening. Hey, folks, this is Mark Marin from the podcast WTF. And really, why are you listening to Mr. Media Radio?